The Big to Move This House has considered child sexual exploitation in Telford. It's a great pleasure to serve for the first time, Mr Holborn, under your chairmanship. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to congratulate the Minister on her appointment, and I know she'll be a great champion of the vulnerable. Child sexual exploitation is a sensitive and difficult subject, and I am grateful to have this opportunity to speak for the victims in my constituency. Telford has the highest recorded rate of child sex offences in the country, and this rate has continued to increase. The House of Commons Library shows that child sex offences in Telford are now at a rate of 18.4 per 10,000 head of population. This is greater than in the higher profile places such as Rotherham and Rochdale and Middlesbrough, and compares to a national average of 7.9 cases per 10,000 head of population. Now we know that this crime has gone on in Telford for over 20 years, and we know that it is still going on. So I'm raising this subject today so that we can better understand the causes, so that we can break the silence that surrounds this issue and give victims the chance to be heard. We do need to find out what went wrong, what could have been done to prevent it, and to ensure that we learn the lessons of the past. In recent weeks, I have met with bright, articulate young women who've come to tell me about their experiences stretching back over many years in some cases. And what came across really powerfully for me was that victims want to be reassured that they won't be brushed aside, they want recognition, and they want acceptance that something went wrong. We all want to have confidence in the authorities in Telford who are tasked with the very difficult responsibility of protecting our young people. And which is why I have asked for an independent review of what happened in Telford. We need to be sure that we have put right mistakes and that culture has changed. And it isn't about blame, but it's about acknowledgement that victims were failed. And pretending otherwise intensifies the sense some victims and their families have that what happened to them was somehow their fault. There needs to be much better understanding of social and cultural attitudes towards women because it was in part the attitudes to the victims that led to this crime being unidentified and unaddressed for quite so long. And we have to move away from victim blaming and shaming. We need to recognise that these were children who were victims of a crime and we must change our perception of these victims. Too often, assumptions were made that these young girls were making choices to have underage sex on a regular basis. We see, for example, GPs handing out morning after pills to the same young girls week after week without asking questions, simply assuming that this was a choice that the girls were making. It is wrong to blame children as young as 12 for indulging in risky behaviour or labelling them as sexually promiscuous. It's completely wrong. In Telford, we have seen a recent phenomena of shaming videos where derogatory terms are used to describe young girls, and these girls are outed for allegedly promiscuous behaviour. It's this attitude to women and girls which promotes a culture which can ultimately end up in it being acceptable to trade women like commodities, and then the women themselves being blamed for it. There has been an emphasis on educating girls and their families about the risks of grooming, but it is equally important that our boys are educated so they do not think it is normal to treat young girls in this way. One of the particularly poignant aspects of child sexual exploitation is that the young victims often believe themselves to be in relationships with the men that groom them. I've had victims tell of the conflicting emotions of loyalty and attachment to the men who befriended them, who gained their trust, but then went on to trade them for sex with other men, and then trapped them as they lived in fear of being exposed or shamed, or their friends and families finding out about what had happened. So it is essential to do more to encourage victims and their families to come forward to ensure they are properly supported and help to overcome their experience. But too many fear being stigmatised and blamed, and for this reason they keep quiet. In many cases, young women who are now adults 
are only just starting to make sense of what happened to them when they were as young as 12. And they may have parents and partners and children who know nothing at all about what happened to them. And it's this shaming which leads to a culture of silence around this issue. And it's for this reason that we should speak out about it so that victims feel more confident about telling them their own stories themselves. And we have to be honest, this is a crime where 95% of perpetrators are men and most victims are young girls. We do no one any favours to ignore this fact or to avoid the conclusion that historical child sex sexual exploitation, like many sex crimes, is a consequence of social and cultural attitudes towards women and of negative gender stereotyping. I commend this government's commitment to dealing with child sex abuse and for setting up the independent inquiry led by Professor Jay, and it is a testament to the government's commitment that they have done this. Now, authorities in Telford have said that no independent review of what happened in Telford is necessary because this overarching national investigation into child sex abuse will look at what happened in Telford. Now, the J inquiry is tasked with investigating child sex abuse in institutions and cases where abuse was reported, but no action was taken. But for victims in Telford, it happened in cars, in the streets, in betting shops and takeaways, and taxis. And we know that many of those victims not only did not report it, but to this day remain afraid to tell anyone what happened. And I've looked at the terms of the Truth Project, which is how the J report will take evidence. It does clearly set out three different scenarios where evidence will be taken from young people. And they all relate to institutional settings or institutional failings to act on, on reports of abuse. On the face of it, it appears the J inquiry does not extend to cover child sexual exploitation. And I should be very grateful to the Minister if this could be clarified either in, your, in, in the Minister's response or after this debate, particularly with regard to Telford. And I'd like to know whether a victim of grooming and child sexual exploitation in Telford can come forward and tell their story to the J inquiry and that their experience will inform the inquiry and its findings. I would add that even if the J inquiry is to cover child sexual exploitation in Telford, we do not expect this report to be finalised until 2020. And given the very many competing strands and areas of investigation, I would like to ask the Minister how likely it is we will get to fully understand the causes of what happened in Telford if we can only rely on the J investigation. A House of Commons Select Committee report into lessons learned from Rotherham, carried out in the 2014-15 session of Parliament, said, we would be seriously concerned if local authorities were to hold off investigations pending the outcome of a J inquiry. And it also noted that the stimulus for action in getting the Rotherham inquiry to take place was the press and not any council processes or external inspections. It is important to, to challenge those in authority so as to avoid any complacency creeping in. And we should all, as members of this place, challenge attitudes towards the powerless and the voiceless. Now, I know that good work is going on in Telford and progress is being made. If we accept that everything is as it should be, and that very well may be the case, there still needs to be recognition that this happened. And there are those who would rather we did not talk about this issue. And I understand it's something that's difficult and we should not shy away from it just because it's difficult. Because if you brush it off, if you say it's all okay now, that is not much comfort to victims. And I would invite those who would rather we did not speak about it to think how that makes a victim feel. And I would urge them to realize what a sensitive, complex issue this is. Not talking about it does not make it go away. Not talking about it diminishes the experience of victims. It is almost to dismiss the experience as if it never happened. When people in authority say, well, it's all okay now, it feels like no one is listening. And we do not want any young woman feeling that there is no point saying anything because nothing will be done or that she will be blamed or shamed or somehow made to feel culpable. 
And there is, in any event, a natural reluctance to go to social workers or the police. And we should do all we can to give victims the confidence to come forward. And I want to say to those girls in Telford who have not yet spoken out, you are not to blame. This was a crime. This was something that happened to you that should never have happened. It takes huge courage to come and see your MP and to talk about this. And I pay tribute to all the bright, articulate young women who have told me their stories. And I also want to touch on the distress that is caused to parents. There's a sense of self-blame. Did I fail my child? I don't know how to make it any better. How could I not have known this was happening? So support for families is a vital part of the healing. I want to quickly pay tribute to the fantastic work of the street pastors in Telford. And I've been out with them at night and seen the work they do with young people, leaving clubs, sometimes worse for wear. People in Telford feel a huge sense of trust and warmth towards them, and they must be congratulated for being such an important part of our community. So in conclusion, Mr Holabone, there needs to be more work around challenging cultural and social attitudes towards women and girls, or this will just keep on happening. And we need to recognise the social and cultural prejudice, albeit unconscious, that exists. And there is, must, there is much that can be done to focus on the perpetrators, the men who buy and sell young girls for sex. And we should be mindful of those who turn a blind eye or who see these girls through a negative gender stereotype. It is not the victims that are to blame. I want to take the opportunity to thank the Home Secretary for a very full and thorough response to my recent correspondence on this issue, and I am most grateful to her for taking these concerns so seriously and making this issue a priority. And I'm pleased to learn that she is sending her officials to Telford to discuss this issue with the authorities. And I know that authorities in Telford are committed to getting this right, and I know they want to build the confidence of the people they're there to protect and the confidence of the public. An independent review will find out why this happened. It will give reassurance to victims that they will be heard and that they will not be ignored. And it will ensure that all is being done that can be done to stop this happening in future. I've been a counsellor and I know how difficult it is, even for the best counsels, to find fault with themselves, to cast a critical eye. And it's easy to drift into complacency or close down challenge by seeing complacent, complainants as a nuisance or those who speak out as somehow vexatious. Respectful challenge is to be encouraged and it's part of a healthy, transparent process that enables victims to come forward and get the help and support they need. And finally, I want to pay a special tribute to one young woman who motivated me to ask for this review and this debate and who is here today. She has been incredibly courageous and has fought hard to make things better for others. She's been willing to challenge the system, to question authority and to put forward solutions to ensure this crime is tackled. I know that she has already made a huge difference to the debate around this issue, and I thank her for that. And she can be assured that as her MP, I will continue to speak for her and for others who have suffered, and to ensure that their voices are always heard.